Welcome to the Inside Southwest Florida Football Podcast. Presented by the News Press and Naples Daily News. One, two, three. Hello and welcome to the Inside Southwest Florida Football Podcast. I'm Dustin Levy, joined by my co-host, the Dynamite Dan DeLuca and Alex Money Martin. Alex, how was your weekend? It was really good. I got to enjoy some college football. Got to really uh, check out some good tennis over the weekend. I was watching some of that. U.S. Open? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it was fun uh, staying up late watching the uh, some of these matches run into the wee hours of the morning. Watched one last night that uh, went about, I think it went to 2.25 in the morning. So that was uh, pretty exciting. I also saw some... Uh, some very bad uh, coaching on, uh, what was it, Sunday night? That LSU-Florida State game? <laughs> Pitching the ball on the one-yard line? I, I don't know who does that, but nonetheless, uh, you know, it was a really good weekend. Uh, and glad to see kind of everything come back. And, you know, Labor Day is kind of the start of a, a new, uh, I guess, a new chapter in, in the year. You know, once you get past this, everything's in full swing. And Dan, did you have time to put your feet up covering three games in five days? No, it was a good uh, reintroduction to uh, to high school football. Having that many, got to cover some Labor Day football at Mariner. So uh, all in all, good weekend. Me and Dan both celebrated Labor Day the right way. You were covering Mariner. I was out at Gateway covering their game against Cape Coral. Overall, a, a fun week of football. Not not as many weather delays as there was in week one. Still. Well, still some, obviously. You know, also a very special moment uh, at Fort Myers on Friday. Alex, uh, what, what can you tell me about the ceremonies with St. Thomas Aquinas? It was the 30-year anniversary of their 1992 matchup, which could be argued that that was the best team that Fort Myers has ever fielded and the best team Lee County has ever fielded. Aquinas comes over for this game, more of a game for the ceremonies and, and the recognition and whatnot. Uh, Margaret Siriani took part in the coin toss, as she always does on Sam Siriani night. Early on, though, pretty much all Aquinas, as you know, kind of uh, it always has been in the rivalry between these two teams. Um, it was 42 nothing at halftime. I believe there were two stoppages in the game due to lightning. You know, it definitely caused a delay, but very interesting to uh, see the gold helmets back out onto that field. It, it had been 21 years to be exact. So definitely those who have been in in the program around it um, probably felt a little bit of nostalgia. Um, but, you know, other than that, uh, Aquinas kind of did what they were expected to do as a, uh, a top 10 team in the nation, pretty much uh, putting a beat down on Fort Myers. Yeah, obviously not a competitive one. We weren't necessarily expecting that. But but let's get into some of these games that, that were really competitive and exciting. Uh, Dan, what, what's a game that, that took your attention? Well, I would say uh, Bishop Vero knocking off Lehigh. If I had said before the game Lehigh is going to have, you know, 500 plus yards of offense, Vero is going to have less than half of that, I think most people would have expected Lehigh to win. But Vero doubled them up where it counted, and that was in the score. They win 33 to 16. And I think what was uh, interesting about it for Vero was the way they won. You know, they beat Port Charlotte the first week by, you know, just having a real explosive offensive effort, putting up 57 points. Against Lehigh, they really did it with their defense. They allowed a lot of yards, but when it counted, they made stops. They turned Lehigh over on down six times, twice in goal-to-go situations, and every time they needed a play, Vero came up with it. What a way for them to win the 300th game uh, in their program's history, and this is what Coach Richie Road had to say about it after the game. Lehigh's got incredible talent, incredible coaches, incredible athletes. We knew it was going to be a dogfight. We knew it wouldn't be easy. Um, you know, so for them to, to respond and, and the defense to carry us when need be with all those skill guys across the board, man, I couldn't be more happy and more proud. Happy for, for Coach Viegas, our defense coordinator, and happy for the defensive group. They, they really, you know, they got a little redemption this week. Interesting comments from Coach Rode. Another really strong defensive effort was what Dunbar did against North Fort Myers. The Tigers just <laughs> came out really ready for this. They only allowed one completion until the final few minutes of the game um, when North was finally able to get on the board. The third quarter in this game was <laughs> endless. It was probably about an hour long. North got so close to the goal line and stop after stop, Dunbar was able to come up with. It, it was really impressive, um, but what broke the game wide open was a 95-yard kickoff return by Anthony Benjamin, who Coach Sammy Brown described as a human joystick, and I, I can't argue against that. But it was a, an impressive effort by Dunbar to prove that they're, they're still you know, the team to be in Lee County, and that they haven't lost a regular season game for 
for two years, and, you know, it's very impressive. And I'd say, especially given the um, number of question marks that this team had early on, um, this is a team that could only put up seven points last year against uh, the Red Knights uh, at their place. I happened to be there for that one, the 7-3 to three game, which is, I believe we had talked last year, Dustin, I think that they held the season low in scoring for, I think, four opponents. They managed to hold four opponents to their season low, which was pretty impressive uh, on their part. Uh, but very interesting to see um, them put up 17 with, uh, you know, the amount on the offensive line gone, you know, not having Dean McCutcheon and Barry White in the fold anymore, um, not having Bobby Dennis. Um, but, you know, they managed to put up 17 points. And, and Anthony Benjamin, you know, once again, if he can't do it in the passing game, he's going to do it another way. And, you know, that, that kickoff return definitely uh, set a tone in kind of a – showed the separation between the two teams with this rivalry you know coach brown even admitted it it can be ugly it can be very you know it's not going to be a bunch of highlight real plays but you know just gritty defense and you know you got to love it that's football without a doubt and, and kind of picking up on another game that we unfortunately couldn't be at just because of geography and location uh, naples goes up to venice looking for a signature win in rick martin's words um, they come up short 12 to 11 I happen to be listening to this one while I was on the sidelines in the second half for the Fort Myers Aquinas game. Naples broke off a huge, huge 50-plus yard run by Kendrick Raphael after Venice scored with about two and change to go. Put him pretty much on the fringe or in Harvey Sarajan's field goal range. Um, it would have been about, I think, a 40 to 45 yarder, but that was makeable for him without question. You know, Naples taking care of the football I'm on first and second down, third down. Raphael fumbles, coughs it up, you know, Venice recovers and, and escapes with a, a pretty big 12-11 to 11 win. I thought that was kind of worth noting because, Dan, you had talked um, last week, you know, if Naples can hang around in this one, that would be a good sign for them moving forward. And it seemed like, you know, they were literally just a, a few plays away from winning uh, on the road. Yeah, I'd think so. And, and Naples is not a program that's, you know, used to moral victories or, or taking things out of losses. I mean, they, they win games like these. But I, I, I think against a program like Venice on the road to go up there, to not just be in that game, but to hold a team like that to 12 points on their home field, I, I think you have to take some positives out of that. Now, are they disappointed, of course, they couldn't pull off the win? Yes, but I, I think that that's really shows some good signs for Naples moving forward, an effort like that. Another game, if only we could have Nick Wilson in as a uh, fourth individual on in our podcast. How about Immokalee, guys? 20-17 yep. to 17 over a team that we, I think we all expect to have at least a, a 500 or better season in Golden Gate, a team that has high expectations. you got to give it up to Redwood and Trenton Villa Royale, doing a really good job in the second half to uh, limit the, the Titans to, I think it was seven points. Yeah, Trenton had uh, 200 rushing yards on 21 carries, and shout out to their field goal kicker who got the game winner, uh, Julian Saldana. So, yeah, really impressive effort by the Indians. Let's go out to the Cape. Uh, Dan, I know you have the pulse of the Cape. Uh, any interesting action up there? I mean, if you want to look at Mariner, I think what Mariner did is worthy of being mentioned. I mean, they end up winning two games in three days. They beat DeSoto on the road 10-7, to kind of a hard-fought game. Friday night, they come back Monday morning, finish uh, the second half against East Lee County, end up winning that one 17-7. Uh, they improved to 2-0 for the first time since 2018, matched their win total for all of last season, and they'll finish up a stretch of three games in seven days this Friday. So I uh, really just want to, you know, it's worth giving a shout-out to Mariner and Coach Josh Nicholson. Island Coast came away with 24-21 win against Everglades. Cape Coral uh, put the beat down on Gateway, 40-5. to So uh, North was the only loser this week, and I don't know if we might have expected that. Yeah, that was kind of shocking. Um, but the, yet again, they were going up against a arguably the most competitive opponent of those teams. Absolutely. North's definitely got some work to do. Bryce DeRoss is kind of meshing into still being a, a starting quarterback. He's got to get used to it. Um, we'll see if he gets time to adjust. I, I don't know, based on last year with Tanner Helton, uh, it seemed like that they were quick to change things up after he got hurt early on. Um, we'll see if that kind of uh, if they if the North staff keeps a similar tune if they go back to Somerset and Divine in the backfield. But um, you know, 
they, they got a big game this week against us. A well-rested South Fort Myers team that did not play last week. Definitely uh, in time for Willis May and company to maybe fix a few things and make sure guys are healthy early on this season. Yeah, that's a game I'm looking forward to. Um, and we're going to get into some of the Week 3 games after this break. Let's go. Keep up with the action every week by following our live Friday night scoreboard at NaplesNews.com, News-Press.com, and by downloading the Naples Daily News and News Press apps onto your mobile devices. Come on. Welcome back, and let's discuss this fun slate of games we have this week, starting with uh, a game that is going to be broadcast on ESPN, the first local game to do so for the first time in since 2006 when Lake Gibson comes to face Lehigh. Lehigh, who is a surprising 0-2. Um, first off, Dan, you were you were around for that 2006 game. What, what was the hype like? Um, and you know, especially around Noel Devine, who who was uh, such a big deal uh, for the Red Knights at the time. I don't really want to be the back in my day guy, <laughs> but back in my day in 2006, you have to remember that to be on ESPN at any time is special, right? Especially when you're in high school. But in 2006. It was really special because it had just really started. 2005 was sort of the first year of ESPN use. They needed some programming. High school football obviously filled a void. There were only four games on in 2005, and the first game ever on ESPN, parent ESPN, main ESPN, uh, was Tim Tebow and, and Nice going and taking on Hoover, Alabama. In 2006, which was the year that North Fort Myers played four Myers on ESPNU. Uh, they had 13 games, so that was the first real year where they had kind of a full high school schedule. If you look now, you know, this year there's 18 games in total, and there were seven games just in the first weekend in August, kind of the kickoff of high school football season. So, you know, there's a lot more of it now. It's become a lot more common to flip on ESPN and see a high school football game than it was in 2006. And I think the fact that it was North Fort Myers and Fort Myers, which is such a huge rivalry and has so much history, it really gave uh, the ESPNU broadcasters at the time a lot more to talk about besides just Noel Devine, right? He was the main reason why they were here, but they were also able to get in a lot of information about the rivalry, about the area, which really made it special. And the scene at North Fort Myers was was like nothing I've seen locally either before or since. I wasn't here in 1992, uh, you know, when the Fort Myers had that great team and supposedly, you know, 8,000 fans are out there to see them play Baron Kyer and Herschel Troutman. There were legit 8,000 people people, uh, you know, in and around North Fort Myers that night, the uh, Moody Field, including in the houses across the street, people sitting on the roofs with, you know, folding chairs and tents up, you know, watching the game. It was really a a unique situation. And one thing I'll never forget is getting there about four hours early uh, because we were concerned about, you know, how we were going to get access and get there. And the home stands were completely filled with people, you know, that far uh, ahead of the game. So it was really, really something special and really something that, you know, kids at that time and and, and the community won't forget. And hopefully, you know, this Friday at Lehigh, it'll be something similar. Yeah, and something similar is that, you know, Richard Young seems like, you know, the 2022 version of Noel Devine, you know, being, you know, the player with the profile to, to kind of make this happen, kind of looking to the present um, and Lehigh being owned too. Alex, do you think they're going to kind of feel the pressure or are they kind of motivated to kind of show out on national TV? I would say that there is some pressure here, right? And, and I say that because they have definitely have some things to work on. They've put up, I think, 739 total yards of offense and they've only managed 20, 25 points um, when, you know, if you have that yardage total, you probably should be ha- having around 60, 70 points, I'd say. I think there is going to be some pressure there, especially just with some things going on internally. It could be a make or break moment for Lehigh this year. You know, this is, I don't know if it's a, uh, a must win for them, but I'd, I'd say it's definitely a can't lose. You know, you can't lose this game on national TV with the best player on the field. Um, this is a Lake Gibson team that was supposed to be reloading this year, but um, all their talented prospects, uh, headlined by Cormani McLean, went, went to Lakeland. 
it'll be one of those games where Lehigh could could feel the pressure, I, I'd say. A lot to look forward to, and, and be tuned uh, to newspress.com, naplesnews.com, for all the coverage we are going to have uh, covering that game, all kinds of photos, uh, stories, videos, columns. It's a special occasion, so we're going to go all out for it. Speaking of an 0-2 team, and I want to look at some of these teams that are 0-2, 2-0, and and see whether we should be overreacting, underreacting. What's a team that comes to mind that you think should we be expecting more or less from if they're uh, winless or undefeated? Well, kind of getting back to Lehigh, I think they had... um pretty big expectations this year i had them slotted in at seven and three for the season that's obviously not going to happen at this rate um, if they can't turn things around quickly they got i'd say somewhat of a favorable schedule coming up after this game Um, they've got i think they've got a few wins there Um, you know definitely some time to kind of change things before they got uh dunbar in the final week but i'd say um um, still some work to be done a team that maybe we could be overreacting on um, perhaps I have them at number six I think in my poll is Gulf Coast um, they're two and0 but they've only played just over a game I've not completed a game they have not completed a game yet they're two and0 um, so that, I think that's you know a team that definitely still in wait and see mode I'd say of all the teams that have played two games you know by default you know you have to look at them um, another team that's kind of uh, kind of interesting is ECS. Hopefully, I didn't take one of your guys' answers there. Um, the Sentinels, they're halfway to a district title now. They'll be able to know before they play SFCA, I think it's uh, October 28th, what their fate is. Um, Moorhaven and SFCA play two weeks before that. So if Moorhaven ends up winning that game, that would give ECS the title, if I'm not mistaken. It'll be a big rivalry game nonetheless between those two teams. Yeah, and you'd mentioned Gulf Coast, and I think you know they're going to be facing Port Charlotte this week, and and that's going to be the big test. If they win that, then you know definitely we're we're going to have some eyes on them. Dan, what's a team? Maybe be they they were green. Um, <laughs> what do you think about Port Myers? Do you think we should overreact or underreact to to their performance at this point? I don't think so. I, I I think if you look at their their week one game against North Fort Myers, and I covered that game. I mean, they had every chance to win that game, and just you know some weird things happened. I mean, they didn't allow an offensive touchdown in regulation in North Fort Myers, and they lost the game. You know, they had a field goal that was blocked and returned for a touchdown. They had a couple chances, you know, to kind of put that game away early, weren't able to do it. Had a punt return touchdown called back on a very questionable penalty so you know one of those things breaks right and Fort Myers is one and one right where we would have expected them to be right since their second game was against uh, Aquinas so I I think you know moving forward I I expect them to start getting some results uh, you know on the field I did want to mention something about Lehigh is I I think there's every reason for them to be concerned at this point and it's not just the fact that they lost these games but it's kind of how they lost especially the game I saw against Bishop Vero could never get anything consistently going in the running game, which is surprising when you have the best player on the field, right, in Richard Young. Some of it was because of penalties. I mean, I, there was a handful of times where they were called for equal, either illegal substitution, 12 men in the huddle. I, I mean, just, just things that, you know, you would think would be ironed out by now and just were not able to get anything going consistently. They'd have two good, uh, you know, first and second down on defense. Third down, you know, they'd blow a coverage in row would get a first down or there'd be a personal foul penalty or they jump off sides and turn a third and long into a third and short you know just things that you know you don't really expect to see out of a team um, you know that has the expectations of of Lehigh so if those things don't get cleaned up and and they lose to Lake Gibson sort of in an embarrassing way where there's a lot of penalties and they just look disorganized I think that could really derail the season for them. Yeah, definitely want to clean some things up, especially there's, there's going to be a few more eyes on this game uh, than, than they might be used to. Another team I think is is worth mentioning, a surprising 2-0 maybe, is Baron Collier. They've done a lot with quarterback Thomas Mooncotch. Alex, what, what do you think of, of the Cougars? I think they've got some pretty decent pieces, and that's despite losing probably their three best players to Naples. It's not just Mooncotch. It's obviously Brian Daniels, who is... Uh, I believe he's leading the area in rushing at this point through two weeks, uh, according to Max Preps and in those coaches who put in their stats. If you do not have your stats in, please put them in so we can recognize your kids accordingly. Not just Brian Daniels. They got Brody Graham, who's a, who's a pretty reliable receiver. Um, they got some decent pieces. I think that 
win over Palmetto Ridge was pretty telling. I think the margin there was notable. They're going to have a, a nice little stretch here. They're going to have to go to Naples in, I think, two weeks or a week or so. That'll definitely be a better indicator where the Cougars are at. So far, so good for Mark Jackson and company uh, going 2-0, and despite all the, all the stuff that's going on there right now. And as we mentioned earlier in the podcast, Mariner was 0-0 on Friday, and now they are 2-0. They are going to have to turn around real quick and, and play Baker, but you know that's an opportunity to to start out the season 3-0. And you know this is a team that you know has plenty of talent. Wins were hard to come by last year, and if they if winning becomes contagious, you know who knows. One thing also, you got to give it to the the West, man. I mean, as Dwayne Mack calls it, the West. I mean, West zone. the West zone is is off to a pretty solid start right now. You got to give them credit for that. I think they only have ballparking two losses between the five or I think the five teams that are out there. Pretty impressive though. Baker's undefeated. Mariners undefeated. Cape is uh, is one and zero if I'm not mistaken. Norse one and one. Island Coast is one and one. So uh, a pretty good start for the West and. Uh, you know, it should be a competitive stretch uh, here in the coming weeks. Yeah, I'm going to be excited to watch some of those district games go down. When we return, we're going to share some of our picks for these Week 3 games. For more in-depth analysis of high school football in Lee and Collier County each week, go to naplesnews.com and news-press.com. Let's just do it, okay? Follow us on Instagram at News Press Sports and NDN Prep Zone. Let's go! And we are back for the final segment of this podcast. It is picks time. Um, pretty good week for all of us. Um, we all went seven and three in different capacities. Um, Dustin and I um, each got SFCA, Golden Gate, and Lehigh wrong. Dan got Immokalee right in North Fort Myers wrong. Um, we were all wrong on Lehigh. We were all wrong on SFCA. Was watching a nail biter on Saturday with Chardon, um, pulling out a big win in overtime. That was one we probably should have mentioned. The Hilltoppers extend their win streak to 31 games. Um, First Baptist, I thought, had them uh, after forcing a pair of fumbles um, in the closing minutes, but they couldn't couldn't close out the team that's won 30 in a row. But nonetheless, you know they'll have a much better, a much more favorable matchup this week. Uh, looking to turn the page, we'll get into that one a little later. But starting off, uh, we got Cape Coral going to Benita Springs, guys. Pretty interesting matchup, I'd say. You know, d- does Benita Springs get back in the win column here, or or do we see a, a Larry Gary coach team start two and zero? I think I like the Bull Sharks here. Um, that's mainly because Cape has such a quick turnaround and they're playing one of the most physical teams that you know you'll face on the schedule uh Josiah Sessler has 79 carries for 321 yards through two games (laughs) wait wait how many carries 79 through two games yes so we're talking 300 carries at least before the end of the year it could be like that for those reasons I I think I like the Bull Sharks yeah, I'm also with uh, Benita here. I like I like them because they're at home and the fact that they have an extra day uh, of rest. You know, Cape is, you know, they're not going to need a lot of rest because it was such a lopsided game. But the fact that you're playing two games in five days, that takes away a day of prep. Um, so I, I think, you know, Benita is going to be more prepared for this one. Uh, give me uh, the Bull Sharks, Dan. Yeah, Benita, it's a very unique offense. And when you have a short week and you're trying to prepare your kids to defend against a a type of offense that you you haven't seen and are not probably going to see, you know, the rest of the season, it's difficult. Uh, I think it'll be close, but I think Benita will find a way to win. Of course. And um, another game, it it was kind of, I guess, an interesting district game last year. It is not a district game this year. Cypress Lake coming off a pretty lopsided 73 nothing loss to tampa catholic headed to astero um who is 2-0 this year for the first time in at least uh two decades or close to can astero start 3-0 that's something that didn't happen last year dustin no it isn't um but i think i like the wildcats i think it's gonna be a high scoring game the game against cypress lake last year was the start of the stretch of district games where astero was just finding an edge in every single one and i just think they they know how to win and you know i think this will be close i think it'll be high scoring but uh i i think i like astero's chances to go three and 
Dan, you with Dustin here? I think Estero is going to win this game. Last year was kind of a shootout. I think it was forty-two to thirty-four, and Estero had to rally, uh, you know, to win that game late. I don't, I don't think they'll have to do that this year. Uh, Estero hasn't allowed a point yet this year. Now, granted, they've played and beaten two winless teams in Northport and East Lee County. I think Cypress Lake will get on the scoreboard, but I, I, I think Estero will pull away and win this one. This is a very tricky matchup, just because Cypress Lake is quietly a pretty decent ball club, and I think that's. 73 nothing loss is mischaracterized. I think they're a better team than that. This game, as Dan kind of alluded to, was close last year. I am going to lean towards the Wildcats, but uh, definitely closer than what people uh, are going to think based on the first two games for Cyprus this year. Next game, game three of ten on this slate. Um, Amakali playing Naples, uh, going to Staver Field. One of the more, um, you know, it's been a rivalry in the past, not so much in the past, I think, two or three years. I'll start this one uh, just because I think it'd be pretty easy consensus. I am picking Naples big here, especially at home during the regular season. Um, it's something, uh, you know, they haven't lost a regular season game in quite a while. Golden Eagles big. I'm not going to disagree with you there. Um, you know, Mockley had some great late game heroics last week against Golden Gate, but he might struggle a little bit against the Eagles. Yeah, I'm going to go with Naples also. Uh, I just don't understand this scheduling. I mean, we had Fort Myers versus North Fort Myers in week one, and now we've got a Mockley versus Naples in week three. You know, there used to be a time where your rivalry game would kind of get pushed back later in the year. It seems like we're playing them earlier and earlier. Pretty interesting, you know, especially we don't see North and Fort Myers play week one often. You know, normally Immokalee Naples is reserved for October at some point, but uh, it's happening in early September. Next game on the slate, Ida Baker going to Mariner. Somebody's going to, uh, you know, be undefeated after this one still. Which team do we think it's going to be, Dan? I think it's going to be Baker. Uh, I think they, you know, they, they had a, kind of a little bit of a rough start against Bonita Springs, but then they kind of settled in. And physically, uh, I think they were able to kind of win that battle against Bonita. I think they'll be able to do the same uh, against Mariner, and um, Baker will win. I'm with you here. I think this is going to be a start of a pretty tricky stretch for Mariner. They're going to have a lot of games where I think they're probably going to be viewed as dogs especially throughout October and whatnot. I'm also with Baker here. Um, I think putting 48 points on Benita was pretty telling in the way they did it. I would expect more of the same here, whether it's Jordan Rizzo, Caden Stengel. I'm going to take the Bulldogs. Yeah, I think it's going to be tough for Mariner with all, all the football they played in the past few weeks. And, and Baker's coming off a Thursday game. They have an extra day of rest. So it, it might be too big a, a challenge for Mariner uh, having to go up against the Bulldogs in this one. Next game on the slate, this game was pretty lopsided i think last year first baptist uh, hosting cardinal mooney this week the lions looking to move to two and one i'll start it first baptist should be able to rebound here with little to no problems olson pat henry he's primed to have another big game after 147 yards receiving up in ohio ethan cross and this will be a nice little bounce back game for him i think you know uh, throwing three picks probably hurt the confidence level for him a little bit um it'd be nice to see him bounce back here i think he does um, I'm going to take the Lions. Dustin? I'm also going to take the Lions. I just think, you know, after that heartbreak in Ohio, they're going to be looking to right the ship here, and I, I think they have a good chance. Dan, are you going to break? Have we disagreed no. on one game yet? Not well, yet. Not, not I, I, yet. I, I, I wouldn't say this is a game where you disagree, though, but, but if you not. do, that's fine. I'm not going to disagree. I think First Baptist wins. Carlo Mooney actually had two of their better offensive players from last year end up transferring to Venice, so they're a little bit down on that side of the ball, and I think First Baptist just has too much. Yeah. So, so far, five games, all the same. We we we're just we're, we're just not we're, <laughs> we're just not giving we're not giving at all. I mean, looks like I I won't be able to build on a two game lead. But nonetheless, uh, Fort Myers going to Riverdale. Uh, if, I think it was last year, maybe it was twenty twenty. But this game saw some pretty wild fireworks. Either one of those years, I think uh, it was like forty nine to forty three or something. It, it, both both teams I think saw that was two years ago. Yeah. Two years ago, both teams saw forty points on the scoreboard. Um, definitely things have changed since then. Can Fort Myers get their first win here, Dustin? Or is Riverdale looking at a 2-0 and start? I mean, this is the game, if you look at the greeny schedule, you're, you're thinking, you know, this is where things get back on track for them. But, you know, Riverdale's got talent. They have uh, Baxter and Jaheim Clark. Uh, it, it's, I don't think it's going to be easy, but I, I think the Greenies are going to find a way. Dan, I mean, can Riverdale pull this one out? They could, but I don't think they will. I think Fort Myers will win and get that first win of the year. They didn't look too 
bad against Aquinas, and they were doing a pretty decent job in some instances of stopping the run, especially against a uh, an offensive line that that you know was definitely uh, superior than their defensive line. I'm going to take Fort Myers here, but I wouldn't be surprised if this is another one-score game. I, I just have a feeling Riverdale is going to make this one really interesting, but I'm going to lean Fort Myers here. Game 7 of 10 on the slate. It'll be Port Charlotte going to Gulf Coast. The Sharks looking to start 3-0, and definitely capable of doing it. Dan, I mean, how, how do you kind of feel about this one? I think it'll be a good game. I think uh, both teams are bringing something to the table here that could challenge the other team. I, I just think Port Charlotte is a little bit more offensively with their running game. I, I think that's going to give Gulf Coast problems, and I think when they need to control the football, I think Port Charlotte can do it, and I, I think they'll end up winning. Dustin? I agree. I'm going to go with Port Charlotte. Um, I, I just looked it up, and they beat their rival Charlotte 41-14 last week. That is, a, you know, not a number you usually see in in that game. Ed Greer ran for 163 yards and three touchdowns, and Bryce Eden threw for 233 against Charlotte. I mean, that's really impressive. Uh, the Gulf Coast defense is really going to be tested here, but I like Port Charlotte to get the win. Port Charlotte has put up 40-plus points in each of their two regular season games this season. I'm not going to say it's three, but they're going to put up points here. Gulf Coast not playing two full games uh, is definitely going to, I think, hurt them here. I got the Pirates um, just because it's going to come back to bite at some point for Gulf Coast not being able, being able to complete a full game. I think this is where it's going to bite them. Uh, give me the Pirates. All right, guys, the ESPN game. Lehigh is either looking at a 1-2 and two start or an 0-3 oh start. Dustin, which one is it? 1-2. and two. I'm going to go with the Lightning here. I think they're going to handle the pressure well. I mean, because, you know, maybe they didn't expect to come into this game 0-2, but we know they have talent on both sides of the ball. And I, I think Richard Young is going to want to show out, and I, I think he will. Dan, are you in unison here, or you got Lake Gibson picking one off? I think Lehigh will find a way to win this game. I mean, you could see it a few times last week against Vero where they seemed just about on the verge of taking control of the game. Um, they cut it to 19-16 to 16 at one point last week, and then they gave up 70-yard kickoff return for a touchdown on the next play. Uh, I think they'll be able to figure out enough to get by Lake Gibson and win this game. Look, Lehigh has you know, hurt me twice this year, right? Or actually, no, once. I picked them last week to win against Vero. You know, that they ended up losing. Lake Gibson is a team that is familiar to playing on national television. They played last year up at, up at Lowndes. They played American Heritage last week, managed six points at the half, put up 14 for the game. Man, it's tricky, but I, my gut tells me Lehigh. Um, I'm going to stay with it. If I keep picking them at some point, they're going to win. I think this is going to be the week that they finally get the win. Game 9 of 10 on the slate, North Fort Myers going to South Fort Myers. Definitely one of those more interesting games. Is North facing a 1-2 uh, a and two start, or is, is it going to be South that's going to be 0-2 after the end of this week? I'm going to take the Red Knights in this one. It's tough because it feels like we have such a small sample size with South. They had a bye last week. They only played three quarters against Gulf Coast. I actually really like their promise on defense. But, you know, if this becomes a shootout, North ha has so many reliable weapons in Bo Somerset, and Andre Devine, and I think it might just be a little too much, especially this early in the season. Dan? Yeah, I don't know if we'll get a shootout in this one. I mean, because despite all that talent that you mentioned on North Fort Myers, they have one touchdown in regulation this season so far. You know, got the one touchdown, their win over Fort Myers, offensive touchdown in overtime. I think they'll need, you know, to kind of put that together a little bit better against South. I think they will, and uh, I think North will win this game. I, I think North has legitimate questions, and I say that, because of what Dan kind of alluded to, um, you know, only one offensive touchdown. Granted, against Fort Myers and um, in Dunbar, you know, two pretty talented teams. South definitely has some, uh, you know, still has some questions to answer after the, you know, after week one. You know, when they put up seven against Gulf Coast, I'm going to take North Fort Myers. I just think it'll be one of those games. Maybe, maybe we don't see 20 points scored in this game total. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. But I think both teams have their fair share of issues, um, you know, especially with the Norse run game. Andre Devine has, what, 70 yards in two games? Um, that's not particularly the most encouraging 
but I'm going to take North as well. Maybe we'll be able to finally get a break on our game of the week, and that's Dunbar going to Vero. I'd say it's more going to be more competitive than last year's 42-8 to beatdown, um, but Dan, I'll start it with you since you've been covering Vero extensively. Um, who you got? Well, I don't think any of us have picked Vero yet this season. And one of the reasons was, you know, what Port Charlotte did to Dunbar in the preseason game, you know, beat them really handily. And uh, I think that kind of influenced our picks for week one when Vero went up to Port Charlotte. I'm not going to make Coach Road happy this week. He was saying after the game last week, keep picking against us. I'm not. I'm going to take Vero. I think they showed last week that they can win despite not putting up huge offensive numbers. They found a way against a very athletic Lehigh offense to keep them out of the end zone. I think they can do that against Dunbar as well. So I'm going to take the Vikings. I think Vero is the more complete team at this point in time. I am going to pick Vero in this one because the ability of playing at home you know that it's comfortable turf for them you know this Dunbar team is not what it was last year I think we can all agree on that that team is going to be very hard to top in its history um, just with how much talent they had but definitely not going to be remotely close to seeing 50 points scored in this one um, Varroa is underrated they've got some they got a couple of talented legacy players, um, Ryan Gadsden being one of them, um, the son of Rod Gadsden who played at Fort Myers. Vero's finally starting to get those types of players in their program, and I think that's going to help them down the stretch, and I think it's going to help them here. Give me the Vikings. Dustin? Well, the very last pick of the pod, and we're finally going to get some disagreement. I'm going with Dunbar. This game was a blowout last year. I don't think Dunbar is hugely worse than last season, and I don't think Bishop Rowe is, you know, leagues better in, in that way that's going to make this that different. I was just, I was really impressed by the effort from the Dunbar defense, and it's going to be tough uh, for them to score. And if they can hit one of those explosive plays on offense, hit Anthony Benjamin, you know, find Sean Ross in the corner of the end zone, I think the Tigers have a good chance. Yeah, and Anthony Benjamin's definitely going to be one to watch in this one. He's just one of those guys who ended up, uh, I think, having a field day against the Vero defense. Eight catches, a buck 14. Two touchdowns. You know somebody's going to have to cover seven. It's going to be a big question. Who who's it going to be? Um, Is it going to be the way that teams used to cover Chris Graves? Perhaps. Uh, yeah, that 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 one uh, picture of him with being triple covered by Mooney players uh, was pretty noteworthy. Um, if you want to dig back and find that on our Instagram page, you can. It's from like October of last year. But nonetheless, that's going to wrap it up for us. Worth mentioning records real fast. Um, I'm 14 and five. Dustin and Dan are 12 and seven. Um, Dustin could either be looking at a one-game pickup here, or a um, Dan and I could be looking at uh, extending our lead against the defending champion. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, come back next week. Um, we'll have plenty of stuff to go over, especially just another loaded week. I'd say um, pretty talented matchups. You know, but we'll be recapping it all, going over it. Teams are going to be getting into district play here soon. We might be able to uh, talk a little bit more about that. For Dan DeLuca, Dustin Levy. I'm Alex Martin signing off. Uh, We'll be back next week for Season 5, Episode 5 of the Inside Southwest Florida Football Podcast. See you then. Thanks for listening. Remember, the Inside Southwest Florida Football Podcast will be available for download every Wednesday at noon to get you ready for upcoming games. One, two, three.